So, going into the 80s, the software crisis was averted by starting to actually pay attention to software processes and software design and actually having separate phases for design, development and testing. However, in the 80s there was another problem with the software development since the uh, conceptual database model and hier hierarchical functional model were often becoming two completely different things. So, the problem was actually that the database model did not meet the requirements of functionalities and the functional model, which defined how the system would behave, didn't actually use the database efficiently. So, on this basis, the decision was that we have to design something which would take the best of both worlds and use them in a way that could be beneficial for designing software. So, obviously, the idea of object orientation was used. The idea that the classes and objects are quite natural concepts to humans. We can define things like chairs and cars and all these other things you probably have heard several times on up courses on object-oriented programming. We also got other ideas like messages, what sort of things we have to tell different components of the software for it to function, uh, what sort of services we should have for different uh, parts, can we reuse uh, objects that, or components that's, uh, that are really, really well thought of, and how can we use abstraction so that we don't actually have to do graphical programming or paper programming, so to say, to first design the entire software and then try to write it like something out of modeling concept. So, more or less, uh, the uh, idea, this idea led the uh, following concepts that were considered beneficial. So, that we should use all the basic concepts of class, object, service, message in each of the design phases. Of course, this would also mean that we could design a diagram which would start out as an abstract model and go towards more mature and more detailed design and we would have to have something that would actually make this possible. Also, we should be able to connect different service layers to each other, for example, design user interface as a separate entity, then connect it to the application logic, which could do whatever it needed to do, and then have a separate database layer in which activities could happen as the database software saw best, but still use uh, standard types of messages to retrieve and store data. Okay, so the, uh, these ideas more or less led to the development of Unified Modeling Language, UML. The language we will be talking about on this course and actually what has become sort of an industry standard, even though it's not official standard, it's de facto standard, meaning that everyone uses it and if you can't read it or understand it, you more or less are of limited capability in software engineering. So, the Rational Software Corporation, also the Rational Unified Process uh, made by them, and they developed this UML notation, the three design legends, James Rambo, Grady Booch and Ivar Jacobson, were the first ones to put together the entire UML uh, notation. Of course, the UML used existing ideas from several places, but these three people were lauded the winners of this uh, design uh, competition for how to describe how software functions. Anyway, the, uh, there's an open standard on UML. It's managed by OMG, which is not, oh my god, but it's an object management group and it, you can access their data from the internet. 
all major software companies are at least uh, somehow involved, if not in any other way, then at least they uh, accept that this is something that's beneficial for them. So the uh, development started in 95 and the version 2, which is the newest main branch version, was accepted for uh, validation in October 2004. So. Uh, what makes the UML function so well is that it actually uh, supports the entire life cycle from requirements gathering to deployment. The UML fits most of the application areas. It can describe embedded systems, administrative systems. You can actually even design games to a certain degree with UML. At least the technical parts of applications are easily described with UML. There's a good tool support there's really really expensive corporate suits to uh, tools like rational software architect also known as rational rose but there's also open source things like star uml or argo uml which make it possible for us and in universities or in small companies to actually use uml to large degree and also since the uml is also related to rational unified process and other process thinking approaches it's also really compatible with many of the official or more uh, defined process models so basically UML has several viewpoints into the software we can have use cases we can have class diagrams objects components how to deploy the software where to put any things, where's the server, where's the database, how activities happen, how state machines work, and collaboration diagrams. So in this uh, picture here, we have the UML1 techniques. Of course, the names have changed in some diagrams for UML2, but the idea is still the same, and UML2 ad also adds a couple of more diagrams. So basically the nice part here is that you can actually get any book on UML techniques, and it's still valid today, because UML1 is 95% uh, compatible with UML2. And actually, uh, the UML2 has 13 diagram types, which define the structural uh, way the program should be built, how the program should behave, and how the program or software should interact. The idea is that we get several different viewpoints from the viewpoint of programmer or designer or user interface designer or customers or business logistics and we can have different views which have no conflict. So basically even starting from high abstraction we still uh, are able to add more details as we uh, as the pro, uh, project matures but still keep the same designs and have internally consistent uh, view on what the system should be doing even without actually defining anything.